Hello, all my pre-retiree and retiree friends. This video is an explanation of what it is to work with a financial planner or advisor as you're entering the distribution phase of your financial life, which is when you're getting towards the age where you're planning to retire and you have to answer the questions of, when can I retire? How do I take income from my savings and assets as I retire? And how do I make good decisions as I cross that transition or transition from working to not working. So this video is designed for you if that's the place you're in. It's going to explain what are the tools financial planners use, how do I work with clients uh, in that way, um, and uh, just educate you on the things that you have to consider and questions to ask. So this is titled Expanding the Life of Your Assets because the idea is how can you make your assets last as long as possible because you've worked hard for them and you should keep as much of that money as you possibly can. Okay, so let's set the stage for this presentation here. So we're going to start by discussing what I call the ideal pre-retirement scenario. When you're employed, your income and expenses generally look like this. And this is the ideal pre-retirement scenario. You have $100,000 of after-tax income, let's say. Your annual spending is $85,000. So you have lower expenses than you have after-tax income, which allows you to save, which is what this green bubble here is. And that green bubble allows you to build wealth over time when you're in the pre-retirement phase, so that you have wealth when you're planning to retire. That's the ideal scenario. When you retire, you face what's called the income inversion. The situation reverses and the predictable income you had, usually either through your business or through your employer, goes away and you end up with lower income that's lower than your desired spending. So you have expenses, let's say, that go down, but they're higher than your income. So maybe expenses of $75,000 a year, to meet your desired standard of living in retirement. And then you have an income, usually through Social Security, most likely maybe a pension, maybe other forms of guaranteed income like an annuity. And those comprise something, usually less than your expenses. In this case, for the example, we'll use the number 45,000. And that leaves you with this red bubble here called the gap. And the gap is that $30,000 per year difference that you need to figure out how to make up through retirement assets. And that is what retirement income planning is. Retirement income planning, which I believe is the pillar of a good transition into retirement that should be done several years in advance of retirement, uh, is the process of closing the gap. It's figuring out how to fund this red bubble here, this $30,000 bubble, through the best decision making and distribution of assets. Okay, so now we arrive at two primary retirement goals that should drive the decision-making process for how you fund the gap. The first is that your money should outlive you, which means that you end your life and you still have money left so that you, you didn't have the inverse scenario, which is you're still alive and maybe you might live five or seven more years, but you've run out of money and now you might have your, your um, long-term care needs or your medical needs as you reach end of life, but you have no money to fund it. So we want a plan that allows you to meet all your needs but have your money outlive you. And then the second is that you need to have a reliable income strategy that maintains a predictable standard of living. You in, ex you in retirement will have a certain baseline level of expenses and those don't change. But if you have to change how much you can draw from your portfolio because one month the market didn't perform very well or because you don't have a good plan and all of a sudden you have to go from taking $5,000 a month to two, that is no way to live. And that is not a plan. That is just chaos. So your, your goals, your, your retirement planning work has to achieve both goals, that your money outlives you, but you also have a plan in place that allows you to take reliable income rather than having the chaotic bounce back and forth. Okay, so it all starts with bookkeeping. And it gets more, I mean, this is important when you're in the savings phase, but it's even more important as you reach retirement, which is you need to produce a detailed expense worksheet and a system to track spending. And I'm gonna show you why in a second. Then you have to check in on it regularly then you have to plan for surprises because it's the surprises that kill your plan. It's the unforeseen medical expense or the unforeseen uh, home maintenance expense or even the foreseen but unplanned expenses like one year auto insurance premiums or one year house insurance uh, premium or the uh, annual property tax or the annual car registration that people don't plan for that oh, they just take money out of savings and then at the end of the year they're like, why didn't I have, why did I spend more than I thought? because it wasn't planned for. So then what we want to do is set up sinking funds. Sinking funds are just savings account where you savings accounts where you set aside money for one-time expenses that you can foresee or estimate you might have and they act as self-insurance for those 
surprises, basically. And then you have to do all this because you need to know what you will spend because you need to produce an income from your own assets that is in excess of the spending after accounting for taxes. That's really critical. You need to know what you're gonna spend because you need to take an income in order to make up that gap, but then you also need to account for taxes on the income you take out of your assets. If you're using things like brokerage accounts or 401k or traditional IRA or anything like that, you're going to pay tax when you take a distribution. So if your gap is 30,000 and you take a 30,000 distribution out of a traditional IRA, it's not gonna be sufficient to meet your needs because you're going to pay tax on that $30,000 distribution. So you have to account for a higher distribution. We'll talk more about that in this plan, in this presentation. So as a financial planner and advisor, the question is how do we optimize the probability of achieving our two primary retirement goals? And that's what I do with clients. This is a slide that's taken from a, a, research, um, a research study that was done to find out what are the decisions within a uh, individual's uh, direct power that can help them improve the amount of retirement income that they can draw either by keeping more of their money, you know, giving less up to the government or by um, having better rates of return uh, or be just better decision making. These are six uh, categories in which foundational decisions must be made that will help increase the uh, overall retirement uh, income value that you can derive. And that's what the, where uh, the title of one of my presentations come from, Re increase your retirement income by up to 30%, uh, because the idea is through good decision making that has nothing to do with portfolio performance, you can potentially increase your retirement income, and which means basically stretch your money out longer. So let's talk about a few of these. The first is social security claiming. When you, when you transition to retirement, you have a, a very critical decision here to, to make. The first is, um, when do you claim? Do you claim when you're young? If you have a belief that social security is gonna go out of fashion or you know, the, the fund is gonna deplete and the, the government will eventually lower and lower the benefits till they're non-existent, you might think it's better to claim social security earlier at 62 so that you increase the chance that you draw as much as possible for the time period in which you can before it goes out of style. And then the question is, if, if you don't think that way, is it better to wait until age 70 and, and take the increase in Social Security payout you get for each year you delay, but you might retire at 62 and, and the plan might call for waiting to take Social Security till 70. The question is, how do you fund life between the age 62 and 70? And that's a very critical calculation that must be made. Is, and you have to find out, is it even possible? And these are just a few of the decisions. You know, other things you might have to decide is like, how do you optimize spousal or child benefits based on your own claiming decision? Um, the other thing is, how do you minimize the amount of your social security income that is taxable while still maintaining the quality of life you desire? Social security is taxed in a very unique way. The more you make, the more that gets taxed using things like Roth IRAs and, um, and loans and life insurance, like uh, some permanent life insurance, you can decrease the amount of taxable income that shows up on your tax return and therefore keep and have less of your social security income be taxed. It's complicated, that requires planning and education, uh, but this is one decision and around social security. The second is Medicare claiming. Medicare is very, very complicated. You have this big t t uh, table up here on the right that's called the IRMA table and it basically talks about What's your Medicare premium going to be once you claim based on your last two years of income? Uh, and you have to understand how past year's income affect future years Medicare premiums because Medicare can be very costly. You can see down here, if you have the base level Medicare, it might cost you 165 bucks a month. But if you make too much money, it could cost you $560 a month. So you have to plan for that. Um, and then the question, the, the next question that arises is when should you privately insure or supplement? You know, you, you might be federal employee and have access to federal employee health benefits. The question then arises, do you do both? Do you take FEHB and Medicare? Do you get rid of one and keep the other? How do you blend things? Um, or when do you privately insure if you have the ability to and have the, the um, assets to do so, when should you privately insure? Next thing we're gonna talk about is tax planning. So the first thing here is how do you avoid and manage the tax torpedo? I kind of alluded to this in the last slide. The tax torpedo is um, a point at which you make too much money and then more and more of your social security income gets taxed. So through creative and uh, planned distributions through things like Roths uh, and, and other vehicles, you can limit how much of social security gets taxed. It requires careful planning. The other thing is when should you do Roth conversions? Converting money from a traditional to a Roth account incurs taxable income in the year that you do it. That can affect 
how much you end up paying in Medicare. It can also affect how much you end up receiving in Social Security, how much of your Social Security is taxable. And so this has to be calculated. It's not just like a spray and pray approach where you just do Roths because you can, uh, Roth conversions because you can. It should be calculated. Then the next question is how much should you take in distributions and from which accounts? Because different accounts get taxed differently. Pre-tax accounts, after-tax accounts, Roth accounts, they're all taxed and treated differently. Then the last one here, which is the critical one, is how do you draw income in excess of spending that is net of taxes? That's, that's the whole calculus, is you have to plan for ta taxes, you have to figure out how to draw it, and you have to figure out how to do so in a way that limits how you're taxed. Okay, now we're gonna talk about planning around your total wealth allocation. Now you move to the investing arena, and this isn't about what investments you pick, but it's about talking about what do you consider when you start to decide how much risk you should take on as an investor based on your age, but not just based on your age, it's also based on your total wealth allocation, which means all the things you own, not just your brokerage account, not just the contents of your brokerage and bank account. Things like your personal residence or business income or closely held business ownership, rental property ownership, rental property income, those should all factor into the risk calculation that determines how your retirement assets in brokerage accounts or brokerage type accounts, that means IRAs, 401ks, T TSPs, 403bs, et cetera, how that allocation is built. That planning can help reduce risk and improve performance over time. The second thing is, when it comes to investing, what's called asset location. So this is, are you choosing the right account types to put the right investments in. This is a very complicated topic, but just to give one simple example, the simplest example I can, it's not simple, is generally you're gonna want stocks or equities in brokerage accounts because in brokerage accounts, these are non, these are taxable, not tax advantaged accounts because you can use long-term capital gains for things that appreciate over time and stocks generally you're buying them to appreciate in value and sell over time. Long-term capital gains, has the most favorable tax treatment. The second is stocks generally pay dividends and dividend income is taxed at 20% as compared to bonds which pay interest income which is taxed at your income tax rates and also has state income tax in some cases depending on what type of bond. Then the last thing is you have the ability to tax loss harvest in a brokerage account and tax loss harvesting can be a very useful tool. So these all make a case for stocks and equities in brokerage accounts. Conversely, bonds or buy and hold investments like ETFs and things like that should probably go into retirement accounts because they pay sometimes, bonds pay current income and those, you wanna defer the income so that it can be reinvested and continue to grow your asset, the total asset uh, value. Um, and then buy and hold investments are just simple and you're not gonna do things like tax loss harvest. You're basically not planning to sell them until you need them much, much later. So they can be better in um, retirement accounts. But anyways, this is a very complicated calculus. These are just two decisions among the many decisions. Finally, and this might be most importantly, is you have to have a drawdown strategy. So once you understand asset location and asset allocation and you've made decisions around, you have the idea of how do you do the Medicare calculus and the Social Security claiming calculus, now you have to start to say, okay, I need to close the gap in my, between my spending and income and I have to do that by drawing down assets. I gotta take income from places. And there are so many different strategies and there's no one size fit all strategy. You have things like the 4% rule, dynamic withdrawal strategies, guardrail strategies, bucket strategies, among others. And I'm not gonna go into each one here, but there is no one size fits all. It all is going to depend on how you want to live your life, what other assets you have, what your social security income is, what your Medicare premiums are. You can see it's a complicated tapestry that has to be carefully calculated in order to arrive at the right strategy. And you might choose different strategies at different times during your retirement. But the, um, so, so this is, this is drawdown strategies. And these are just, you know, everything I've talked about today is these are things among other financial planning strategies. You still have things like estate planning guidance, wills, trusts, powers of attorney, medical directive. How do you make gifts, charitable giving, gifts to kids, transition of assets, legacy, you also have insurance planning and you know there are other financial planning considerations that go into it what we've talked about today is the central pillar around which other good financial planning decisions and recommendations should be made my advice is always 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 work with a professional and do it in advance of your retirement because mistakes can be costly i cannot say how many times people have called after they've had to take a lump sum distribution from their pension or they've chosen to take a lump sum distribution from their pension made a mistake paid 30 or 40% in taxes, and now their total asset value is 
close to half what it was when they were employed. And you just can't go back. There are no do-overs when you make mistakes. The other thing is you need to kind of have an idea of what you're going to spend and what you're going to need to make from your, uh, your closing the gap number before retirement so you can plan ahead and understand how long will your assets last and make an informed decision on when to retire and what to do with your assets when you retire. Uh, you, get, you don't get do-overs. Most people will retire once if they're lucky and you hope that you retire once. If you have to retire twice, you've made a mistake because that means you went back to work and you're now kind of going for a do-over, but it didn't work. You made bad decisions. Now you have to go back. It's not what you want. Um, so the idea here is save yourself the pain. Seek out a fee-only fiduciary financial planner or advisor. Fee-only fiduciary refers to the way in which that the advisor gets paid. The ways advisors get paid dictates the quality of their advice to you. It kind of determines who they really work for. I have separate guides that you can read and watch to explain what is a fee-only fiduciary, how do you qualify financial advisors, what questions do you ask. They're on my YouTube channel. I'll flash links in the description and I'll put them on the screen. Um, but I recommend watching those as a next step. Um, and then as a second call out or recommendation, I have a free training video that's at this link here at the top, app.thepeakfp.com slash free training. I'll put it in the description to this video as well. Um, and it's basically a video guide that walks you through um, how to increase your retirement income by up to 30% and avoid running out of money in retirement uh, based on that um, advisor gamma study that I referenced earlier. It's all through the power of decision making, not through squeezing out higher investment rates of return. And so this allows it to be in your locus of control because you cannot control investment returns, but you can control personal decisions, personal behaviors, making good decisions, having good behaviors will ultimately be the biggest driving factor uh, in not making mistakes. And this video will talk about the different strategies that were discussed in that study, uh, as well as how to understand the financial advisor uh, uh, universe, what questions to ask, how to qualify financial advisors. So it's kind of like a one-stop video that will address all those things. Um, th now, uh, just a reminder, we do address investments, the investment selection, asset allocation. Those are all important. Uh, but the, just a, the, it's just a reminder, those are not in my control or your control, right? I may have more expert, uh, experience and research, but I cannot promise rates of return, and I never will. And any advisor who does um, will be causing you pain and problems because you cannot, detect, you cannot predict exactly where markets will go or which investments will produce what rates of returns. So having a plan that is um, oriented around personal decisions and personal control uh, will almost always produce better outcomes. Anyways, if you have suggestions, comments, questions, please leave them in the comments. Um, there is a, a companion video to this video, which is designed for accumulators or savers. So if you're in the pre-retirement phase where you're still building wealth, and it's a financial planning video on how I work with clients to achieve the best wealth building outcomes, again, through things that are in their direct locus of control. Uh, and it's very helpful. So if you are watching this video and you maybe have kids, who are in the planning and savings phase, you can refer them to the companion video and it will set them on the right foot. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. If you have, as I said, comments or questions, you can leave them in the comments here or you can go to my website at thepeakfp.com and find my uh, contact information there and send them my way. Um, I look forward to, uh, to answering and helping out in whatever way I can. Thanks for watching this video.